Yes, my name is David Bertiger. I'll be chairing the session today. Um, let me first uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the, the Bidjigal people, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. All right, so this session's um, been conducted on behalf of the Health Economics and Health Systems Advisory Group. And we're talking about reflections on the International Health Economics Association Conference, which was a, um, a meeting held in Cape Town in July this year. It's one of the largest health economics meetings in the world, or probably the largest. Before I launch into some of the presentations, we've got a few pictures of the group. So we had about seven of the, the Kirby folks there in person, a few others attending online. This is the a group of us having dinner at the function. So there are about 1,200 people there. It's a good, a, a fantastic meeting if anyone has any interest in health economics. We also met some of the locals, enjoyed some of the food in Cape Town. And this is Joyce, Paul and Sophie. They did actually walk to the top of Table Mountain, which is about a thousand meters towers over, over Cape Town. <laughs> Launching into what we actually did there. So this is just a, a, a summary of what the Kirby's involvement was, was at IHEA. So we, we ran an organized session that was chaired by Virginia Wiseman. We had Carolyn Watt speaking there, Joyce Wu, Sophie Shi, uh, and Rabia. And they were talking about point of care and innovative um, methods for treatment of in infectious diseases in key populations. Um, we also had Ching Lu presenting on incidents of catastrophic health spending in Indonesia. Paul was presenting on cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of mass drug administration. Um, for his work on hookworm control in Vietnam. Uh, and I was also presenting a couple of posters, one on uh, the viability of chlamydia infections amongst those who were diagnosed with NAT. And I'll go into that in a little more detail later on. Um, and some other work I do in, in Mali around community case management. All right, so just a quick outline for today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the economics of um, antimicrobial resistance, the, the work that was presented at IHEA. Um, Sophie's then going to take over. Sophie's in Melbourne, so she's going to be joining us online. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, evaluating equity and cost effectiveness analysis. And then Jean Paul Cesar de los Trinos uh, is joining us from Vietnam, and he's going to be talking about financing of universal health coverage in low middle income countries. And then we'll have some time for QA. Um, I will just remind you for those online to, to enter your questions uh, in the chat uh, on Teams, and for those here to use the microphones. Uh, so those online can hear you. All right, so launching right into my part, uh, in economics of antimicrobial resistance. So inappropriate antimicrobial use continues to exacerbate antimicrobial resistance. And there are a couple of presentations on this. Um, this first one from Tunisia was an audit of 131 public and um, private doctors using standardized patients presenting with acute viral bronchitis for which antibiotics wouldn't be required. So for those who aren't familiar with the, the standardized patient methodology, essentially it's a fake patient. So somebody who's been trained to present with a certain set of symptoms, and then they, they document how the, the healthcare worker responded to that. <clears throat> so in this case, 66% of doctors prescribed an antibiotic to the patient. It was actually worse than that amongst private sector doctors. 20% uh, of doctors prescribed an antibiotic that's considered high priority for stewardship by the, the World Health Organization. And interestingly, prescriber behavior wasn't influenced by patient knowledge. So even if the patient said, you know, are you sure you should be prescribing this? It could be viral. They were still prescribed an antibiotic. We had another example of a standardized patient um, study. So this time using pharmacies, uh, looking at pharmacies in Nepal. Uh, in this case, uh, so the standardized patients were presenting as though they were a parent of an under five child who had a viral case of diarrhea or upper respiratory tract infection. And in 427 interactions, pharmacies provided antibiotics in 92% of cases where the, the parent was presenting with a kid who had diarrhea uh, and 19% of cases where the kid was presenting um, with upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. And interestingly, the interactions typically lasted for less than one minute, so in 52% of cases. So we clearly still have a problem with inappropriate antimicrobial, antimicrobial use, particularly in low middle income countries. And this study went on to look a bit further into in terms of the, the implications of that. So you know, with more antibiotic use, you tend to get more resistance. Um, and this study was looking at the cost of, of antimicrobial resistance in, in two hospitals in Ghana. So they were comparing patients who presented with an infection that was susceptible to antibiotics and then patients who presumably with a similar indication, but with a, a, um, an infection that was resistant to antibiotics. And they found that the length of hospital stay due to antimicrobial resistance was about 4.2 days longer in one hospital and 5.5 days longer in another hospital. Um, and that each patient uh, with an antimicrobial resistant infection typically saw typically required four to seven hours more doctor time um, than somebody with a with a susceptible infection. 
And then looking at the economic implications of that, they estimated that that cost the two hospitals um, around about $650,000 per year. Um, so that the, the extra costs associated with dealing with antimicrobial resistance cost $650,000 per year. So having said that, there, there was some work presented about the, the difficulty in estimating the cost consequences of antimicrobial resistance and also the health consequences. Um, so this work by Nicola Naylor, who's at the, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, was talking about the, the AMR unit cost repository. So this is a new open access global database that attempts to synthesize in, uh, the, the evidence, um, collate the evidence and, and conduct analyses to basically provide uh, unit costs per hospital case of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and the, there was a lot more detail that Nicola presented, but essentially her, her point was there's a great deal of uncertainty in this. And I, I guess that makes sense when you think about it in a bit more detail. I mean, antimicrobial resistance is sort of often presented as though it's sort of one thing, but it's very heterogeneous. Um, you know, you've got different drugs, different pathogens, um, pathogens presenting in different places and then different settings. And so trying to estimate how much antimicrobial resistance costs, um, especially on a broad scale, is very, very difficult. Uh, and these guys are trying to address that. All right, so despite the difficulty in estimating costs and health, health consequences of AMR, um, there's a lot of work being conducted on how to try and find cost-effective ways to prevent AMR. Um, this is one study uh, set in Moldova, which is a high TB setting, and they were looking at whether a shorter simplified regimen of rifampicin, uh, for rifampicin-resistant tuberculosis uh, was cost-effective compared to the WHO-recommended treatment. Um, and what they found was that on average, the, their shortened regimen increased qualities gain per patient and saved 2,588 US dollars per patient. So promising findings there um, for high TB settings. There was another study, um, this one in Tanzania, looking at post-market surveillance to combat substandard and false, falsified um, anti-malarials and antibiotics. Um, so that's quite a problem in low middle income countries. They estimated, the authors estimated that about 13.6% of antimalarials and antibiotics contain substandard medicine or falsified medicine. Uh, obviously, that's a problem in terms of antimicrobial resistance because you're potentially um, uh, treating patients with sub substandard dosa or treating them with an antibiotic or, or um, therapy that isn't actually what you thought it was. So the authors estimated that to set up a post-market surveillance system in Tanzania would cost around $370,000. However, that would save lives. And ultimately they found that in an investment of $1 into post-market surveillance would actually bring about a return of around $240 to $270. All right, and then moving closer to home, this was work presented by Rabia Adawia, who was a PhD student here. She was evaluating the cost effectiveness of using point of care uh, resistance guided treatment to treat uh, mycoplasma genitalium in women in Australia. This is a, an emerging or a, a new technology. And Rabia showed using her Markov model that the point of care resistance guided treatment for uh, mycoplasma gonorrhea, uh, sorry, genitalium in women aged 15 to 45 would save money and gain qualities compared to current management. So it was, it was cost saving. And then finally, the, the poster that Arthur and I presented so this is looking at the viability of chlamydia infections. So um, nucleic acid amplification testing is the, the gold standard for diagnosing chlamydia, um, but it does seem like it picks up infections that are not actually viable. And so there's some new technologies emerging to try and detect how much or, or which infections are actually viable or not. So we pulled that work together and we, we reported that amongst 15% um, of uh, women presenting with a, a positive NAT test um, from a sample of the vagina, 15% of those, those apparent infections are actually non-viable. And amongst patients presenting with a rectal infection, about 45% of those are non-viable. So we went further then to, to say, suggest um, withholding treatment amongst those patients who have non-viable infection could substantially reduce doxycycline and azithromycin consumption, and it would save around 400 to $720,000 per year in Australia. All right, I won't go into questions just yet. Um, that's the end of my presentation, but we'll go over to Sophie now. Um, and I'll let Sophie introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophie Shi. I am um, the uh, Senior Research Fellow at the CERP. Um, so today I'm going to report some of the um, 
presentation uh, related to equity analysis uh, at the AHIA conference. So without saying that, um, I would like to start my presentation by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kuning Nation where I joined the meeting today and pay my respect to the elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, so um, in achieving economic efficiency, uh, we need to ask three key questions. Uh, the is um, what to produce, how to produce and who gets it. So these are three uh, questions basically can be assessed or evaluated through economic evaluation methodology. So um, the first question, what to produce, it's about allocative efficiency. And the second question, how to produce, the, um, is about technical efficiency. And these two questions could be addressed by the standard economic evaluation, for example, cost-effective analysis, cost-utility analysis, and cost-benefit analysis. And the third question, who gets it? Who gets the, uh, the, the product? It's more about equity. Um, so that is about the equal, you know, equity, the distribution of the benefit or the distribution of the product. This question is sometimes uh, not usually addressed by most of the uh, economic analysis. It's because the standard economic evaluation is unable to uh, quantify to provide decision maker with information about health inequity impact of the intervention being evaluated. Um, and also the, it, the, the standard uh, methodology is unable to uh, capture the nature and the size of the trade-off between the improving total population health and the reducing unfair health inequity. So um, that is where the new methodology uh, coming in that we call it informative health uh, economic evaluation. So because uh, in the past, the 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 most the the, the thought of you know uh, people think equality is equality regardless you know who acc accrues it or who gets it, but now um, more and more uh, issues is is a is around the, you know the distribution of the quality who gets the who gets the quality who gets the benefit. So when we talk about uh, equity, it should be noted that the distinction between equity and equality. So equality is about sameness in which that everyone is treated the same way in respective of the individual condition. In contrast, e equity is about fairness, which you provide, you know, you consider individual position uh, with the support to achieve the justice or achieve fairness. Um, so when we so this graph is a, a, a famous you know a graph to show the distinction between equity and equality. So if we want to incorporate equity into the economic analysis, there are many things to be considered. For example, you know type of equity we are an, an, uh, assessed and theoretical basis for each um, uh, analysis methodology. And most importantly is the evidence requirement for the analysis. Uh, and last and the last and uh, um, last point uh, to consider is the communication of the study result and the methodology to the uh, user, especially policy makers, because there's uh, lots of technical um, uh, jargon, technical skills needed and uh, to understand the methods and how to interpret the results. So there are many methods that can, inc can, um, can incorporate uh, equity into economic uh, analysis. Um, uh, there has been um, talk about this methodology for a long time, but in recent years, there are new methodology being developed in this space. For example, distributional cost-effective analysis, DCEA, or extended cost-effective analysis, uh, that was short for ECEA. And some uh, country also show multi-criteria decision analysis um, uh, to uh, address the equity issue in the decision-making. Um, among these today, I would just going to I'm going to focus on the DCEA today 
and give some example to show this new methodology and how the, the new methodology can be incorporated or um, into the future analysis in economic uh, study. So DCEA um, is one type of equity informative economic evaluation, and it's a framework incorporating health inequity concerns into economic evaluation of health sector intervention only. So it focuses exclusively exclusively on health benefits and opportunity costs. So this is a two important concept falling on the health sector. However, it's not able to provide the non-health benefit and the opportunity costs outside the health sectors. There are two steps of conducting the DCEA. The first step is to model the baseline distribution of health and then move on to the second step is to quantify the changes in total population health and unfair health due to the intervention um, uh, introduction. So I'm going to uh, use a case study that to demonstrate the methodology and the application of a DCEA. So this study is a, a, a modeling study uh, that uh, presented at the AHIA by a PhD student at um, from University of Sydney. It, it the 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 study is a, a it's called EQ EPO CH model. So it's quite a mouthful uh, um, title of the model name. It's basically it's called they they name it e equity informative early prevention of obesity in childhood. Uh, model. So they use this model to conduct equity informative economic version of childhood obesity intervention um, to analyze the uh, children's BMI for distribution or cost effective analysis. So um, the, they use the model and uh, they model uh, the intervention effect from three uh, individual trials. And this uh, stands for three different interventions. So the first intervention is called, um, it, it, it's, it's about infant sleeping intervention. And the second one is a, is an infant uh, intervention for a, a, a POI combo. So that is the intervention for uh, breastfeeding, food activity, and sleep. And the last, uh, and the third one is called high five for kids, which is a uh, clinician-led uh, treatment for primary school age children with obesity and uh, overweight called high five for kids um, so this table basically showed the study result from three different trials uh, in terms of the BMI in different uh, social economics groups and intervention cost per child uh, to be modeled in the DCEA so how does the DCA model conduct it? The first component is to quantify the net health benefit by qualities. So they apply that um, the trial result into their equity specific model uh, and to, to quantify the total population health benefit in terms of quality. Um, and then uh, the second uh, component is to quantify the uh, equity impact by slope index of inequity, SRI, uh, between groups. And how do you present the result? I'm not going to the detail of the de technical um, details of that model and how to conduct this year, but uh, just give an overview of, um, of this methodology with this case study. So the way to present um, the, uh, the result is to plot the net health benefit in terms of quality on the y-axis against the equity impact on the x-axis uh, that is uh, quantified by the quality change between groups. And this is the, the result from the base case uh, of the model of the study presented at the AHIA conference. And there, there's um, the study also conduct, you know, different kind of sensitivity analysis to test the different assumptions. Um, it, for example, the cost effective stress or use in the model, the uh, an even opportunity cost between the groups in the model, and the if intervention effect size, which is coming from you know uh, the, um, clinical trials, and then you test on different effect size and into the model to see how does it impact on the um, the 
uh, distribution of cost effectiveness result. So these are also other uh, DCA presentation at the AHIA conference uh, in July. So another example is the um, study using DCA methodology is to assess the health and economic benefit of reducing the cardiovascular health equity gap in Australia. This is um, a study presented by um, um, Professor Adami from uh, Monash University. So again, they use a si similar, but um, they develop their own model to uh, modeling the total health benefit against the quality uh, equity impact. So similarly, a DCES study of cardiovascular prevention by modeling uh, in African population was also conducted uh, by um, uh, a doctor from Mohi um, Billy University of Health and Allied Science in uh, Tanzania. So um, they use a more simplified model to see different ways of the uh, cardiovascular prevention uh, ap apply into uh, uh, African population and to see the uh, the total health benefit against the equity impact of uh, different guidelines. So there are many challenges and uh, um, so there's also other study present uh, DCEA and ECEA and other equity analysis at the AHIA conference. I just can't list, you know, every one of them, but it just give everyone a flavor of what is the um equity informative economic evaluation. This new methodology has been um, tested and applied to different uh, population for different conditions. For example, the cardiovascular example, the uh, children's obesity uh, example. So, and most of the, uh, up till now, most of study are modeling study. They uh, kind of uh, develop their own model and to model the long-term quality gain versus the equity impact. However, um, another study from uh, uh, by a PhD student from Monash University also present the equity um, consideration into the design of the clinical trial. So there will be more and more uh, you know, new uh, way of conducting this, this kind of equity informative economic evaluation. So over the past probably 10 years, they, they, the, the, the most challenges uh, that we reported by the researcher is the data limitation in social economic specific data, uh, intervention effect size or the outcome of the interest uh, being evaluated. Um, so because the so that means the co data collection in the future, for social economic specific data, for example, using the ABS um, uh, social economic index uh, for areas uh, into the data collection or co incorporate into the modeling is uh, the consideration for future um, research to think about if um, uh, equity informative uh, economic analysis is on the horizon of your research. And um, there's the consensus about the cost effectiveness threshold is also a challenge. Uh, whether you know the fifty thousand per quality as a standard threshold is applicable to every population and every condition uh, is still something to be explored. Um, and also the most um difficult um uh, and 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 technical bits to understand is the distribution of healthcare opportunity costs when we conduct the equity impact analysis. However, one of the study from the African population, they, they conclude that despite all these challenges that the, this new methodology, equity informative health economic evaluation is now uh, become a feasible, um, it's now uh, a viable options uh, even in low and income countries. So I think I should just come to the end of my presentations. Yeah, we're going to hand over now to Paul. Um, Paul is the chief scientific officer at MetaHealth in the Philippines. He's also a PhD student um, with the Global Health Program here at, at the Kirby. Over to you, Paul. I'm calling in from, I'm calling in <clears throat> from the Philippines in, in Manila, where it's um, 30 degrees and uh, cloudy. So it's, um, yeah, it's very different from Sydney. So 
Yeah, and for this session, um, as with um, Sophie and um, David, I'll be presenting um, my insights from the IHEA Congress 2020. And when I was um, thinking about it, I was actually thinking, what are like, the common um, themes of what I attended? Because as um, David said, I, I, pre I presented my PhD project, which is an economic evaluation of mass deworming. But actually, a lot of the sessions I attended were not on economic evaluation. So a lot of them were actually concerning um, financing universal health coverage in low and middle income countries. So hopefully, um, yeah, we learned something from um, from my insights, which are not that technical, but hopefully, um, yeah, we get some thoughts about um, what I experienced during the IKEA Congress. But before anything else, I think tomorrow is the Are You Okay Day. So really hoping that everyone's okay there in Sydney and, and elsewhere. Okay, so what are the key themes? In my participation, when I attended the AHEA, so what are the key themes that I thought of um, after attending AHEA? So there's actually three ma major themes. So costing gap, health technology assessment, including its uh, the progress towards institutionalization, and um, in including the adaptive HTA, as well as the models for universal health coverage. So costing gap. So actually, one of the first um, sessions, uh, workshops during AHEA is about the costing gap, um, specifically in lower and middle income countries. And even in Australia, even when we are doing our research, we know that in health economics and outcomes research, costing is actually one of the more neglected area of um, methods. Like We would have a lot of methods dedicated for estimating outcomes, but for costing, there's a lot of challenge, spe specifically for costing of public health interventions, where we are not only concerned about the cost of the drug or the adverse events or for the health personnel, but also for the program implementation cost. So what's interesting about this is that workshop was actually being facilitated by Palladium. So Palladium is actually a multinational consulting firm. I think this is based in Australia. And they are very active in providing support to various African countries on costing. And when they were presenting the model, it's actually a very simple cost model. So if I remember correctly, it was an Excel-based model for costing. It doesn't really allow a lot of capacity to account for uncertainty. So no no Monte Carlo simulation or other fancy stuff that maybe Sophie and David would uh, know more about. But despite the simplicity of that model, they were actually able to make it useful, to, to use it, for example, in activity-based costing in Kenya and Uganda. And Palladium is even um, helping... Ethiopia, Malawi, and Rwanda when it comes to benefit package design because the um, activity-based costing that they're doing is using is being used to inform health benefit package design. And then there's also a talk on what are the di different challenges when it comes to using the costing data. So one of the glaring challenges um, is actually the shift from case rates and benefit packages to prospective global budgets. So we could imagine a lot of lower and middle income countries in Africa and Asia they are still using case rates and benefit packages, and they conducted a lot of costing studies to actually inform those packages. But now there's actually a gradual move to prospective global budget. So, for example, in the Philippines, we are doing it in the next few years. And a lot of the work on costing for case rates and benefit packages will actually be less useful. There's also a concern on using cost data to support predetermined policies. So this was flagged by some of the Ministry of Health staff in Africa that was uh, present there. And of course, even if they have the data, they have the evidence, if they don't have the, the resources, then they also could not make use of the costing data. Even in others, even in our setting, so they are also experiencing challenges with costing productivity, productivity losses, specifically because there's a lot of different methods and, and at least um, for them, there's actually no standard way yet of how to estimate um, productivity, for example, in the reference cases. What's interesting in that particular workshop and in other workshops there is that they actually are maximizing it as, an, as a platform or as a venue to actually secure commitment from health ministries. I remember during that particular session, the staff from Palladio were actually securing concession, or not only concession, but commitments from the, from the speakers regarding what they want to do um, during the implementation of their projects. And I thought it was a very clever way of actually maximizing um, that conference, not just um, use it for networking or to present, but also to have um, tangible um, outputs with your stakeholders. And then the, aside from costing, there's also a lot of discussion on health technology assessment, particularly on its progress. So there has been a rapid progress in HTA institu institutionalization in lower and middle income countries in Asia and Africa in the past decade. Um, in Southeast Asia alone, um, the Philippines, actually, we just started our um, 
Health Technology Assessment 2019. And even um, Singapore, which is the most developed economy in Southeast Asia and probably, possibly in the region um, some by some measures, they just started their health technology assessment with their agency for clinical effectiveness, I think, in 2016. So there's a lot of development. It's actually really good because these LMICs are also the countries where we need better um, resource allocation that is being helped by HTA. Now, one interesting study presented there was about the PROS. So PROS is a self-assessment scale for evaluating a country's progress in um, HTA. This was um, work by Baker et al. And I think this is a very useful tool, especially if you want to evaluate the different countries when it comes to how far they have progressed in HTA and what could be what could still be done. There was also a very interesting study regarding the return of investment of a specific HTA in India. This is by Bahuguna et al., wherein they estimated how much it costed them to do an HTA for a particular technology and what would be the outcome. So I think this would be a very great tool and um, also advocating, for example, if you are advocating the government in institutionalizing HTA. And PROS actually stands for Progression Scale for Institutionalizing EIPS, and EIPS stands for Evidence Informed Priority Setting. So not the very simple acronym, but I think it was a very useful tool. Another important topic that actually caught my attention is about the adaptive um, health technology assessment. So we know that health technology assessment is a very long process. So we start with a clinical evaluation, clinical assessment. So determining if the technology is effective, then there would be economic assessment, fiscal evaluation, and even ethical, legal, and social and health systems impact implications. So at least in the Philippines, that's actually what we are examining. I think you, we have more streamlined process in Australia. And that HTA process could easily take maybe one year in Australia, and in the Philippines, it could take up to two years. And the thing is, sometimes we actually need the data very soon. Decision makers need the results of the HTA to inform their decisions. So this is where adaptive HTA comes in. Adaptive HTA is a systematic adjustment of the time, data, capacity needed, and source of conduct for HTA to expedite the process. So finding out what could be done to expedite the HTA process. And there are usually three triggers for this, at least based from the presentation. Adaptive HTA would usually be triggered by urgency. So, of course, COVID-19 pandemic would come into mind. And then certainty. So, for example, if the drug has already been um, approved by other HTA agencies, or, for example, if it's included by um, in the essential medicine list by WHO, or low budget impact. So, suppose the budget impact of the technology is just a million dollars, and conducting the HTA would take hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, would you really want to have a full-blown HTA to evaluate that? It's good to know that um, adaptive HTA is already being practiced by at least 20 countries and also one HTA network, which is the European Network for Health Technology Assessment. And um, coming from the Philippines, I'm also like very proud that Philippines is also one of the few lower middle income countries which have a systematic adaptive HTA as shown in the map on the right. Now, well, the development of adaptive HTA is really great, especially for decision makers wherein um, the, the results, the evidence from HTA will be made available uh, faster. It became apparent during that session that the implementation of adaptive HTA needs improvement. So, for example, there was a um, Ministry of Health staff, I think the guy was uh, from the Ministry of Health staff from Ghana, and he, he was presenting how they do the adaptive HTA in Ghana and also how they do the normal HTA. And when we were like reviewing the process, it's actually very similar. I think there was just some differences with the topic nomination. And when we asked him, how do they expedite the process? He actually answered that, well, if it's adaptive HTA, they would work on weekends or they would work after office hours, which is actually not really the point of adaptive HTA. So in adaptive HTA, what you want is to actually streamline the process and not to work on um beyond the working hours. So for example, if if it's um if there's a vaccine for COVID-19 which was um, back in 2019, uh, it's a very new um it's a very new disease. So I mean, are we really going to wait for a, a phase 3 clinical trial to actually have the full HTA or would there be like other um ways to actually expedite the process? Another thing would be um of speeding it up the process is for example, if there's a lot of certainty in the data so, for example, if it's albendazole or mebendazole, which is already included in the essential medicine list, 
I mean, would you really want to still have to do a full HTA or could we actually make use of maybe the findings of the WHO or maybe of other HTA agencies and find a way to incorporate it in the current HTA um, process? So yeah, lots of work needed to be done on adaptive HTA, but um, nonetheless, this is a very good development for decision-making as well. And lastly, um, what also caught my attention during IHEA is the models for universal health coverage in lower and middle income countries. And um, it's very interesting that um, there's a lot of stakeholders that are helping um, countries, uh, developing countries when it comes to attaining lower in, um, universal health coverage. So we have, for example, the World Bank and USAID, which are usually the funding agencies, and then Palladium and Thinkwile, which are the multinational consulting firms. So they're supporting um, Asian countries in reforming health financing. And uh, um, actually, in, in I think at, at least two sessions, um, that uh, it was highlighted some of the biggest democracies in Asia, for example, India, which is actually the biggest democracy, and Indonesia and the Philippines, which are the two um, biggest democracies in Southeast Asia, they are being highlighted as the models of, on moving towards universal health coverage in LMICs because these countries, they are democratic countries, um, capitalist-based, and also has a very big population, but they are moving ahead when it comes to increasing, um, to attaining universal health coverage. And what's common among these three countries is there's, in the past years, there have been increased public health financing, usually demo from domestic sources. Um, in the Philippines, for example, we have the same tax law wherein the cigarettes and alcohol are highly taxed. I think same with Australia. And because of this increased public health financing, also from collection of higher premiums and better collection of, premium, of insurance premiums. And because of this, there is also a marked reduction in out-of-pocket expenses, which is what we want to do because OOP... Um, results to catastrophic health expenditures, which is what we want to avoid. These three countries also have well-developed national health insurance schemes. So for example, in India, you have the Ayushman Bharat, among other agencies. Um, and then in Indonesia, you have the BPJS, Kese Hatan, and in Philippines, we have the PhilHealth. Now, a common challenge observed among these three countries is that collecting premiums or the payment for insurance from the informal sector is very difficult. So as, unlike in Australia, where in a lot of the businesses are, for example, registered, in, in, in the Philippines and I think in Indonesia and in, in India, there's a lot of challenge with the informal sectors. When we talk about informal sectors, these are, these are for example, like the vendors or the professionals that are not registered, but they are actually earning a lot. So they are not poor. They are actually earning a lot, but they are usually flying off the radar from the tax. So this is still a continuing challenge um, in these three countries. And of course, the COVID-19 um, pandemic tested the health systems of these countries. I'm not sure if Rabia is here, but at least for the Philippines, I would be not really proud. But I could say that we didn't really have the best COVID-19 response. So we were like caught off guard. I mean, even though we all had evidence from before. So this COVID-19 actually tested how good the health systems are in some aspects. This delayed some progress because some of the resources for towards universal health coverage are being diverted to address the pandemic. But at the same time, it actually made universal health coverage and strengthening health systems more important, uh, a, an urgent concern um, for the governments, which is, I think, a good thing. So what are my key points? Um, the key points that I took away from IHEA. So first, there has been tremendous progress in LMICs towards universal health coverage, which again, is very important because these are the countries where the people suffer a lot of burden from different diseases. But still, there's further work needed on costing, HTA financing, and other key aspects of universal health coverage needed in LMICs. LMICs. But interesting to note that there's actually less need for breakthroughs in HER method, at least from what I observed, and more need to apply good practices and fast studies. And then we have foreign aid agencies, such as USAID, DFID, and even Australian aid, multilateral development banks, such as World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and consulting firms such as Palladium, Thinkwell, and hopefully in the future, um, MetaHealth, are among key stakeholders involved in assisting LMICs towards universal health coverage. And I think um, for an early career professional like me, this actually provides opportunities to work on reforming health financing and strengthening health systems in LMICs beyond the academic settings. Because I guess when we are doing a PhD, sometimes we will think that we could do, we, that we have to stay in the university to actually do uh, make some change. But in that IHEA Congress, I actually uh, noted that there's actually a lot of other stakeholders or partners that we could be involved with 
and still um do a lot when it comes to attaining um universal health coverage. And yeah, and my last takeaway is Cape Town is an awesome place to visit. So I really enjoyed my visit there. I was um with good friends. I was also with Sophie, um, David, uh, Joyce, others. I forgot the names of everyone, but yeah. Um, and that sums up my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Do we have any questions in the room? Thank you. Okay. Hmm. Oh, it's just a question around some of the costing for antimicrobial resistance. And um, it's clearly a pretty tricky, complex area. And the association, obviously, of AMR with you know, major comorbidities and, and uh, multiple hospitalizations and so forth. So how do you sort of go about sort of working out the contribution I don't know, versus the sort of counterfactual in terms of if you had a strict uh, antimicrobial stewardship, you could sort of reduce it and et cetera, et cetera. And um, just be interested in terms of what data is available, what, for example, randomized control trials have looked at various interventions to reduce it and how you can utilize that that information in terms of co overall costings. Yeah. I think that's a huge question. <laughs> um, and I, I don't profess to be an expert in that. Um, I think that's the sort of thing we need to speak to people like you, Greg, and get a sense of how to get that information. I think, I think it just needs to come from from more empirical data. Um, I mean, it's not an area that I'm really across, but I imagine that there are large randomised interventional studies that are addressing AMR in terms of trying to reduce its sort of incidence and impact, um, and you know, multiple different. I imagine things that are being like looked at. You know, I mean, I mentioned sort of, you know, antimicrobial stewardship. I mean, as ID clinicians, we're obviously involved in that, and that's a big sort of push uh, at the sort of acute sort of hospital level. Um, but yeah, it's a, such a huge sort of and you know globally uh, emerging sort of area. Um, but then there's a lot of expertise within the Kirby, so maybe it is a. Uh, an area for a bit of a forum around and discussing. I'd, I'd be really fascinated about what sort of interventions are being sort of looked at, for example. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely think it's something that we need teams of people working on, and that, that's what the, the London School of Hygiene is sort of working on. But I think I think it needs more than just that. Yeah. A uh, question for Sophie about the different methods for equity analysis and incorporating it into, I guess, health economics assessments and stuff. Um, it seems like there's a lot of different approaches are they is that a sense of trying to answer different things or is it just sort of no consensus yet about the best way to maybe measure or calculate sort of equity yeah uh that... thank you richard for your question i guess the different method that has been presented so far actually used for different purpose to answer a slightly different question for example, distributional cost-effective analysis is usually used for uh, assessing the total population health benefit against the equity of uh, impact in terms of distribution of this benefit among different groups. So an extended cost-effective analysis is more about uh, for the purpose of um, assessing the financial uh, hardship, especially in a low and middle income country, that is more in the financial protection um, of the intervention. Um, and another methodology for is a multi-criteria decision analysis. Uh, it's more about a framework without too much quantifications, uh, but they, some, they set some criteria uh, especially for HTA uh, process or procedures among decision makers to make a decision about uh, reimbursement for a cert uh, you know, certain items of healthcare um, or medications that uh, whether they meet the criteria they define, uh, but in, in their local settings uh, to, to help and facilitate the decision making. And the old 
um, the long history of the equity analysis uh, before the recent new development for DCEA and ECEA, in the past, there is a lot of uh, uh, analysis based on weighting, which is they put different uh, equity weight for different um, uh, uh, framework and analysis technique. Uh, that is another uh, one to uh, has been considered for a long term for a long time and uh, but it, it there's no standard way you know to, to say you know the the weighting has been validated is it good for one country whether it's good for another country that is another discussion point so uh, among all these methods um, that Track my attention is more there's a, more and more from from the past 10 years literature and publication you can see more and more studies start to incorporate that the equity consideration for example by DCA and ECA is is kind of the trend for the future but it having said that it doesn't mean that uh, you know, other equity analysis framework is useless because I think they uh, fit different purpose of, of um, uh, decision making and uh, research questions. Hi, everyone. Hi, thanks, Sophie. Um, just adding on this point about equity, I, I remember that the one of the early papers written by Gavin Mooney and Karen Gerard was in the late 70s, early 80s on is a quality a quality? In other words, does it matter who receives the benefit and who doesn't? So that was the early times when they started weighting these outcomes, depending on who's receiving the benefit. But it kind of ebbs and flows. It it sort of becomes a priority for a while and then it kind of disappears again. And I think part of the issue is that, um, you know, not everybody, not all policymakers actually agree on whether equity is the major goal um, when they're um, funding investing in healthcare programs and how and trying to determine trade-offs with efficiency so for nice international in the uk that do a lot of the reimbursements i mean they're they're basically um uh using cost effectiveness evidence to determine what gets funded under the national health insurance scheme um they've been talking about equity for a very long time and the recent updates the guidelines there do emphasise the importance of equity, particularly for orphan drugs um, um, and also neglected tropical diseases, all these areas that wouldn't get a look in if you really didn't think about equity. Um, but it's still something that they're struggling with as well. And most of that evidence at the moment is still qualitatively presented by you know, advocates and consumer groups at the meetings when they decide on what's going to be subsidised and what's not. And it's not explicitly built into the economic models yet. So it's a it's a tricky area, but it's important. Thanks. There's no questions on that, so go for it. Did you, so was there any, um, just uh, outside of what you talked about, was there any discussion about how health economics fits into the wider economy stuff? So things about impacts on health to, you know, the macro economy or microeconomy, you know, business and whatnot, because I'm just thinking about so the big theme of COVID and, you know, restrictions and whatnot. So I was just curious if there was much talk about that. Nothing that I attended. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Virginia, Joyce? Anyone online? Um, I don't see many presentation at Ahia. Uh, looking at the macroeconomics uh, uh, in relation to uh, health economics, uh, but uh, in the uh, so I I actually recently I come across with a term called so we know quality quality adjust life year we know DALI disability adjust life year and I come across with a term called poly productivity adjust life years which is kind of developed by one of the um, health economists at the Monash University, they incorporate productivity, which is more general economic terms that, you know, uh, and and build that productivity into uh, uh, a common measurement to evaluate the value for uh, health program and intervention. So that is the new thing that I come across recently. So that could be something that link to the health economics that we always do 
um, and to um, the connection to the macro economics in terms of productivity. There are certainly there's some really big groups working on macroeconomics and health. Um, ANU, uh, one um, big hub, and then London School of also Hygiene and Tropical Medicine got another group. Harvard have another group. So there's quite a lot going on in that space. Um, and I think we need to, the um, health economists who are the more the you know, microeconomists need to connect with them a lot a lot more because you know for infectious diseases um you know we've we need to demonstrate what are the big um returns on investments and they go beyond the health sector um and we need to really be demonstrating that, that there's lots of Im improvements potential improvements in whether it's in education or other sectors of the economy yeah thanks if there's no more questions i'll ask you to thank our speakers <clears throat>